welcome to this special Cabbage Lecture that's on Lucy Maud Montgomery. Uh, I'm Barb Helander. I am a Cabbage member. I'm also the coordinator for the Kindred Spirits Book Arts Exhibition, and I'm going to be your host for the evening. As many of you are aware, this year marks the 150th anniversary of Lucy Maud Montgomery's birth, and Cabbage has elected to organize a book arts exhibition in recognition of this milestone. The exhibition is called Kindred Spirits, the Lucy Maud Montgomery Legacy as Interpreted by Contemporary Book Artists. Now, many of us only know Montgomery through her most popular novel, Anne of Green Gables. So to get a better understanding of Canada's national treasure, uh, we've invited Kathy Wasilenki, past president of the Lucy Maud Montgomery Society of Ontario, to give us more insight. In, in, in essence, Lucy Maud Montgomery beyond Anne of Green Gables. And I will be introducing Kathy shortly. Uh, we've certainly been very delighted by the enthusiastic response to this lecture. In fact, registration has been so brisk that we had to enlarge our Zoom plan to accommodate everyone. So a really big thank you for your interest. No doubt you may know of friends who wanted to attend this, but maybe the time was not convenient. Do let them know that we are recording the talk and it will be posted to the Cabbage YouTube channel for later viewing. And you'll find the link to our YouTube channel in the chat. Now, many of you in this room uh, are Cabbage members, but I will say most of you are not. So for non-members, you're likely wondering, why do I keep saying Cabbage? No, I'm not referring to a large cruciferous vegetable. It is the acronym for the Canadian Bookbinders and Book Artists Guild. So a little bit about us. We are a not-for-profit organization. We support, promote, and, and seek to inspire the participation in traditional bookbinding and contemporary book arts. Cabbage provides high-quality book arts education, information, resources, and networking opportunities to the Canadian book arts community, as well as to the public in general. And if you want more information about Cabbage, or maybe you'd like to enroll in one of our introductory workshops, please check out our website. A link to that has also been posted to the chat. And while you're on that website, you'll also find wonderful information about that Kindred Spirits Traveling Book Arts Exhibition. It will be launching in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island in June. And in a nutshell, what it is, is Cabbage members have been invited to create a book arts related object born of their respect and admiration for the life and works of Ellen Montgomery. The exhibition is open to all levels of experience and even if you aren't a member, your registration fee will include a one year membership. And now maybe some of you are attending tonight's lecture hoping to be creatively inspired and if so, that's terrific. Just keep in mind the registration deadline is soon, it's January 29th. Uh, and the completed work must be received by April 1st. And I'm sure everyone can appreciate that there are costs associated with any initiative, especially one the size of Kindred Spirits. If you are so moved, I do invite you to visit the Cabbage website where you can donate to the Kindred Spirits exhibition specifically or donate to our organization in general. And you'll find a link to that in the Zoom chat as well. So with all that housekeeping out of the way, it's now my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Kathy Wasilenki. So a little bit about her. From childhood, Kathy always dreamed of being a teacher. She attended David and Mary Thompson Collegiate in Scarborough, and upon graduation, followed that dream by attending Toronto Teachers College. From 1965 until 1997, Kathy was an elementary school teacher at many Ontario school boards, such as Scarborough, York, and Durham Region. During this time, Kathy also attended university where she earned her Bachelor of Arts in Psychology and Anthropology, as well as her Bachelor of Education. Upon her retirement from teaching, Kathy ran a bed and breakfast in Uxbridge, Ontario for 10 years, and following that was elected for two terms as a ward counselor for the township of Uxbridge. It was during her terms as ward counselor that she developed a deeper interest in Lucy Ma Montgomery's work. After all, Montgomery lived in the Uxbridge area from 1911 to 1926. In 1998, Kathy joined a local organization known as the Lucy Ma Montgomery Committee, 
While on this committee, she spearheaded the restoration of the Leesdale Manse. The manse was where Montgomery lived, raised her family, and wrote her many novels. Following the restoration, Kathy became president of that committee, but during her tenure, they became an independent, not-for-profit organization known as the Lucy Maud Montgomery Society of Ontario. The society purchased the church where Montgomery's husband, Ewan MacDonald, was minister, and this is now the Visitor's Welcome Center for the property. It should be noted that the Leesdale Manse is a Canadian National Historic Site. Kathy continues her association with the society as a life member, actively participating in its continued growth. She has been a frequent guest speaker at Lucy Ma Montgomery events, has led discussions on Montgomery's work, and often can be found conducting tours at the Leesdale Manse. And presently, she is writing a book on the life of Lucy Ma Montgomery in Leesdale. As time permits, Kathy will answer questions after her talk, so please put your questions in the chat. So welcome, Kathy. We look forward to your talk this evening and learning more about, in your words, the mistress of the Leesdale Manse. So Kathy, over to you. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Uh, I, I'm hoping that you'll get a, a brief glimpse into the complexity of Montgomery's life as a writer, a minister's wife, and a mother. Montgomery's books were not only for children, they were also for adults. She had a sophisticated style and covered many mature topics, such as hope, perseverance, and finding a place in the world. Humor was very important to Montgomery. So I will start my uh, presentation with her life and move on to her writing. Um, we'll leave 15 minutes for questions. So if I don't quite get through it, uh, we'll have done the best we can. Montgomery became a world-renowned Canadian author after her novel, Anne of Green Gables, was published in 1908. It went on to sell over 50 million copies, outdoing authors like Hemingway, T.S. Eliot, Lawrence, and Virginia Woolf. Her sales success was envied. She also wrote numerous other books, many short stories and poems, and a biography of her career called The Alpine Path. And you can see here in the pictures, there's the original one done by Page Publishing, the first Canadian copy done by Ryerson, and then uh, a couple of samples of the different languages that Anne has been uh, published into. Lucy Maud Montgomery was born on November 30th, 1874 in Clifton, which is now called New London, Prince Edward Island, to Clara McNeil and Hugh John Montgomery. 1876 brought sadness as her mother passed from tuberculosis before Maud was 21 months old. They had been staying with Clara's parents during her illness and Maud then continued to live in Cavendish with her maternal grandparents. Lucy Maud, oh. The surroundings of the McNeil home in Cavendish became Maud's refuge and inspiration. She grew to love nature and her beloved Prince Edward Island. Her imagination and curiosity evolved. She had imaginary friends she had created. They lived in the fairy room behind the bookcase. Maud was raised very strictly. Um, I can't see my whole screen here, so I'm just gonna ad lib in some cases. Um, she, oh, affection was never expressed openly in the family situation. She grew up to be inquisitive and very precocious as the only child 
in the McNeil household. She also grew uh, highly uh, sensitive or hypersensitive. And perhaps this came as the, because of the loss of her mother and her father moved to Saskatchewan when she was young and remarried. Her grandfather also was a very sarcastic person and had low expectations for women. She started school at age six. She was exceptionally intelligent and a passionate reader. Further, she had an amazing memory. She quickly absorbed everything she read, heard, and felt. In 1890, at the age of 16, Maud was allowed to visit her father in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. Her grandfather, on her father's side, Senator Montgomery, accompanied her by train. She found it very hard to adjust to life there, and it wasn't long before Maud and her stepmother were at odds. Father now had a new young family, and Maud often had to mind the children. She got very homesick. So in August 1891, Maud returned to Cavendish, hoping that she could attend college. In August 1892, it was decided she would go to Prince of Wales College in Charlottetown and get her teacher's license. In July, she got Excuse me, I'm going to, um, again, she got a posting um, and she started with 20 pupils, but as her teaching reputation grow, grew, she had a class of 60 by the end. This workload was made life difficult for Maud. She resigned in 1895, hoping to take courses at Dalhousie University in Halifax. In 1896, she succeeded in getting some of her pieces accepted for publication. Her year at Dalhousie was great for building her confidence as a writer. Maud was upset, in fact, that she had to go back to teaching the next year. In the fall of 1896, she took a teaching job in Belmont, fronting on Richmond Bay. She disliked her posting and left Belmont at the end of the year and went back to Cavendish. She obtained a new position at Lower Bedeck School in the fall of 1897. Unfortunately, Grandfather McNeil died in March of 1898, very suddenly of a heart attack. Maud had to leave Bedeck unhappy as she did love her life there. She returned to Cavendish as her grandmother needed her at home. This began almost 13 years of care for her grandmother. She also helped in the post office, which her grandmother and grandfather had run for many years and with the housework. Her life at home was rather uneventful. She busied herself with literary society, prayer meetings, socials, and of course, uh, church going. In 1901, she managed with her grandmother's permission to go to Halifax again. Um, they managed to get one of her um, cousins to come and mind grandmother. So she got a job at the Halifax Morning Echo and Daily Chronicle as a proofreader, and on Mondays, under the name of Cynthia, she wrote Around the Table, a column of fun, fashion, fads, and fancy. However, in May, grandmother needed her back, and she returned to Cavendish. In Cavendish, she did a great deal of reading, which she loved to read. She was an avid reader. And she also did a great deal of writing during the winter of 1902, 1903. So this would be poetry and short stories. By June of 1903, she had developed a new philosophy. I am earnestly trying to teach myself to live in the present and stop meddling with the future. 
It is a hard lesson for one of my temperament to learn, but it makes life endurable. During her years in Cavendish, Montgomery continued to write and sent off numerous poems, stories, serials to Canadian, British, and American magazines. She had a number of boyfriends. The one who caught her attention, however, was Ewan MacDonald. Ewan had been inducted on September 1st, 1903, as minister of the Cavendish Church. The young women in the church were very interested in his comings and goings. This morning, we had a Highlander to preach for us, and he was just lovely, and all the girls got stuck on him. My heart pity patted, so I could hardly play the hymns. It's weak yet, so I will stop short. She was the organist at the church by then. In May 1905, Ewan moved closer and right into Cavendish. This was a very easy walk to the church and to the grand grandmother's post office. So Maud used her charm to win him when he came. They became secretly engaged in 1906. In 1905, she had written her first and most famous novel, Anne of Green Gables, in Cavendish. She sent the manuscript to several publishers, but after receiving rejections from all of them, she put it away in a hat box. In 1907, she decided to try one more time to get it published. She was thrilled when Page Publishing of Boston decided to publish it and was even interested in her writing a sequel. Anne came out in 1908. On June 20th, she wrote, this is the epoch of my life. Her book had arrived. It was an immediate success. Letters arrived from fans of Anne around the world. The two letters she coveted the most were from the poet Bliss Carmen and the author Mark Twain. His secretary, Ivy Lyon, wrote on October 3rd, 1908. Mr. Clements directs me to thank you for your charming book and says I may quote to you from his letter. In Anne of Green Gables, you will find the dearest, most moving, and delightful child since the immortal Alice. The sales were outstanding. She continued to write. Anne of Avonlea was next, and then the story girl came out. In 1911, unfortunately, grandmother got pneumonia on the 6th of March, and five days later, she passed. The only mother Maud had known was gone. The house was immediately taken over by grandmother's son, so Maud moved to Park Corner. Um, and Park Corner was the home of her cousins, which I'll explain later. Um, a few weeks later, Ewan, who by now was preaching in Ontario to uh, two postings, one in Leesdale and one in Zephyr, asked for a leave of absence for three months so that he could return to PEI to marry Maud. So the Park Corner home um, was where she married Ewan McDonald on July 5th, 1911. They had a wonderful honeymoon in the British Isles. These are just a couple of pictures um, of her, her trip there. Ten weeks they spent in the British Isles and had a wonderful time. So they visited traditional sites like the Burns Cottage, um, Stratford, on Avon, etc., and they visited also sites that they had decided they'd love to go to, like Fingal's Cove in Scotland. 
They returned from the honeymoon and they arrived in Leesdale and stayed with the two Oxtaby ladies. She quickly gained the parishioners' respect with her accessibility and willingness to help in all church activities. She seemed to energize the women and the youth of the community. Ewan was already well respected in the community as he had been there a year. She was overjoyed in early November when she thought she was pregnant. She was nearly 38 and Ewan was 41. Maud worked on the Chronicles of Avonlea, a collection of her short stories, and it was released in the spring of 1912 by Page. She spent her time then reading, of course, and writing her second storybook novel, The Golden Road, throughout the spring of 1912. Chester Cameron MacDonald was born on July 7th, 1912. Fred, or Frederica Campbell, Maud's cousin and kindred spirit from PEI, came out to Ontario to help. Maud found the closeness of Toronto a real bonus for her, and she often went to Toronto to meet with other authors. Maud seemed very contented with the manse. She was very busy with church meetings and being a mother. She did manage to get to PEI every few years. The Golden Road came out in September. And in September 1913, she began another Anne book. In August 1914, an event happened that would consume Maud emotionally for the next number of years. England declared war on Germany. World War I had begun. During that similar time, August the 13th, 1914, her second son, Hume, was still born. The grief was overwhelming for her. On November 20th, Anne of the Island was finished. It was written under stress because of the war and the grief and loss of her baby. Maud announced her third pregnancy in her journal on March 19th, 1915. On October 7th, 1915, another son was born. Ewan Stuart MacDonald was a chubby, healthy boy. In late November, the ladies of the church organized a Red Cross branch of which she was president. She had so much going on, but she felt she must do it as it was so important to the war effort. Here's a couple of pictures or three pictures of Stuart. He was a little different looking than Chester. Um, oh, and she was uh, wealthy enough to have um, a nurse come to the house for a month before each birth. And so here's Stuart with uh, the nurse. And she did have all her children at home in Leesdale. By now, she was being regularly wined and dined by various literary groups in Toronto. The Press Club gave her an afternoon tea in Toronto on March 14, 1916. And that evening, McClelland and Goodchild of McClelland, Goodchild and Stewart called her to discuss a Canadian publication of her next book. They would do her poetry book. She was upset with Elsie Page by now, as he seemed dishonest. A very nasty letter came from Page, her prior publisher, on the 12th of July, and he threatened to sue her. Although not active in the suffragette movement, Maud was happy to cast uh, her first vote on December 19, 1917. On Tuesday, May 7th, 1918, another APOC for Maud and for Ewan, they bought a car, a Chevrolet five passenger. As a minister and a minister's wife, 
you had to be cautious. You didn't want to have a car when no one else in your congregation did. So they certainly waited. They had Queen, uh, their horse and a buggy. And even in the winter, they used Queen and the buggy to get around because the roads were so bad. On December 1st, she announced that the war was over. Her kindred spirit and confident, Frederica, or Fred Campbell, passed fairly suddenly in January 1919 from the Spanish flu. Every January in the future, she would mourn Fred. Ewan was suffering mentally at this time as well. This was the start of a dreadful worry for Maud. Religious melancholia was the diagnosis. Here's some family pictures of them. Um, so you can see Ewan with Chester and Queen, their horse, and one of her groups that she had in for a Christmas gathering, the Guild Group, um, and Stuart, uh, sorry, Ewan again with the two boys there. In April 1920, she received a copy of the Further Chronicles of Avonlea from Page. Note that the date is quite a bit later and she had already thought about switching. It resembled the Anne books to deceive the public. He ad she advised Rollins, the lawyer to she hired to sue them. She said she would not stay by, well, page publishers illegally tricked her and the public. And there's a lot more to that story, but I won't dwell on that. In late 1920, she worked on her Emily novels and a few short stories and verses. In 1921, unfortunately, they had a car accident in Zephyr, their other placement, and they were being sued. Maud was haunted with the thoughts of the bailiff coming to their door. Ewan would eventually lose this case. She changed her will so that none of her money could be taken uh, to pay for this because Ewan refused to pay. Also, there was a talk of unionism within the church so that the Methodists and the um, Presbyterian churches were unionizing in some cases into united churches. Maud was against this. She was angry about it. And Ewan also was against it. Ewan's mental illness was still unpredictable. And at times he was down for days. In the summer of 1922, the family vacationed in Bala, Ontario, um, a place that Maud grew to love. The first bit of great news in 1923 was that the Royal Society of Arts of Great Britain bestowed a great honor on Maud as they asked her to become a fellow. She was the first Canadian woman to whom this honor was given. Emily of New Moon came out at the end of August 1923. After three years of fighting, Maud finally won her case against Page. Page now decided that he'd take it to a New York court rather than the Massachusetts court where he had just lost. So Maud would have to fight them there, having to get new lawyers, etc. She had finished Emily Climbs in January 1924. And it had been almost a year since Ewan had had an attack, but in March, he had a very serious one. It was hard to hide Ewan's condition from the community. Now she did manage to do it fairly well. The Delineator magazine had asked her to write four stories and they were to be on Emily and would be published in 1925. By now she was getting quite a tidy sum for her stories um, and not just a magazine subscription or 
you know, the privilege of having her poem published. Maud and Ewan planned a trip to Kentucky to see the Mammoth Caves. This trip was wonderful. The, uh, the children went as well and, and one of her friends. Um, October 23rd, 1924 was another election day. So there was some excitement in the Leesdale Hamlet, but of 128 votes, only 16 were wet. All the rest were dry. And this led to the Ontario Temperance Act being passed. She went to Hamilton to speak at the Business Women's Club and McMaster University. She traveled uh, all over Ontario doing public uh, speaking. And uh, so uh, when she came back from this particular trip, um, she came back to more talk of union. And this was upsetting not only them, but the congregation, and it was also dividing the congregation. She finished writing Blue Castle in February 1925. She had been suffering a great deal from stress. Um, her work, her writing, being a mother uh, caused constant stress for her. And uh, Ewan continued to suffer as well. She hoped that they could both get well, but she thought that it would take another posting to do that. In 1925, Emily Climbs, her 12th book was out. The reviews were quite good. And at an anniversary service in Oxbridge, which was just about 10, well, um, I'm going to say 10 minutes. It's 10 minutes for me. So it certainly wasn't for her. But um, Oxbridge was fairly close and she went to Oxbridge to do shopping and so on. Um, in December 1925, sorry, was the anniversary. And Reverend McKay told Ewan about a church that was open in Norval and it had a double charge. So the other charge was Union northwest of Toronto. Ewan immediately arranged to preach there on December 20th. And on the 23rd, a letter came saying that Ewan had the call for Norval in a unanimous vote. It was settled. They were leaving Leesdale. And so they left in February, 1926. Maud was extremely sad to leave. Ewan, of course, not so much. He wasn't quite as emotionally attached uh, as Maud was to place. So the manse at Norval was lovely, but life there was even busier in Norval than in Leesdale. The Blue Castle came out in the summer of 1926. In October 1926, she finished Emily's Quest. That's the third, I believe, in um, her Emily series. So there were three books. On October 17, 1928, she created a new character, Marigold, and she finished Magic for Marigold. It did take her two years. She had never had such a hard time to finish a book but it was because of all the stress and so on. Finally, after eight years, it was over. Paige could take the case no further. She won and would receive a check in November for $15,000. Magic for Marigold came out at the end of August, 1929. She did not have a title for the book she completed in 1931, but they finally chose A Tangled Web. Maud was going to give up writing in her diary in 1931, but she couldn't. She was in the habit of writing and that was hard to break. Also, she had no other outlet she hadn't uh, developed any close friendships, 
for fear of gossiping and uh, sort of uh, causing problems with, with Ewan's um, station at the church. Uh, so again, that year, the seriousness of her depression was unmistakable. She was crying all the time. She was impatient and restless. Pat of Silverbush was out in the summer of 1933. She did stop writing in her journals for a three-year period. The next entry was dated September 1936, and she admitted that it had been three years since she wrote. But she said, I cannot live without it. I must have a confidant of some kind once more. So uh, I need to write things out. It will help a little. It always did. And I need all the help I can get even to endure. The children, meanwhile, had done very well in school. And when it came time for high school, she sent them to St. Andrews College in Aurora. They did very well. And um, when they were at home uh, during their younger years, they were cared for by housekeepers um, when Maud was busy with her church affairs and her writing. As the boys got older um, and, and Chester got ready for university, Maud was horrified as he was missing classes at university and in the end failed his first year. He also got in trouble with his girlfriend, which caused a great deal of embarrassment for Maud. She was so distraught over this, she felt she could not go on. Her first entry for uh, February was very depressing. The days in this sad, laughless house have been nothing but ghosts. Struggle as I will, I cannot feel anything but sad and heartbroken. Stress and emotional upsets uh, had always affected Maud deeply. On May 7th, Ewan had a terrible night. He was lost, doomed to die. Maud was living in suspense and fearing he would get worse. His religious melancholia continued and it was decided he should go to Guelph to the Homewood Sanatorium, one of the largest mental health and addiction facilities in Canada. Maud was most upset that there was no support from the congregation in Norval and no one came to visit. On February 14th, after Maud was, after Ewan was released from uh, the sanitarium, he went to a sectional meeting. It was reported that there were people who were not coming to church because of him. He felt that the only thing he could do was resign and leave Norval. Also, a letter had come from the Toronto Presbytery saying some congregations were behind in their payments for their ministers. The man who received it assumed that Ewan had complained and took this letter to a special meeting. With this, Maud and Ewan could understand why people were upset, uh, upset. but they were also upset because no one ever approached Ewan for an explanation. And Ewan had never written the letter. It went to all of the churches. Some of the congregation wanted Ewan to stay and fight, but Ewan felt he could not work with men who behaved the way they had. They purchased a new home in Toronto, and Ewan decided to retire. He na she named it Journey's End, as she hoped she would never have to move again. On March 16th, she wrote, I packed all the books in the garret today. She was most upset at leaving Norval. She decided to write a new book while well, in Toronto called Anne of Windy Pop Poplars. 
by then she was traveling to Toronto too. And um, she was elected a member of the literary, oh, sorry, no, um, she, this is different. She was elected a member of the Literary and Artistic Institute of France, a wonderful honor, especially for a Canadian writer. And this was also extremely rare. Kathy, we've got about five minutes. Okay. okay. So, yeah, professionally, she was on the executive of the Canadian Authors Association. She had a very pleasant December, but on the 31st of December, she fell off a ladder and sprained her wrist and spent time in bed. 1935 closed amid rumors of war. In September 1937, she went to PEI thinking it would be her last trip. In April of 1938, she had a serious mental breakdown. In 1939 was the end of her journal writing. Parts of her letters to her pen pals gave us some idea of her state of mind. She did not think she would ever recover and her mind was going, she could not write. I'll just read you the one to Ephraim Weber, her pen pal. She wrote in 1941, my husband is very miserable. I have tried to keep the secret of his melancholic attacks for 20 years, but the burden has broken me at last. In 1942, she wrote, life has been hell, 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 and God forgive me for what I may do. Um, her husband's mental collapse had weighed heavily on her. She was taking drugs to keep herself going and finally, on April the 24th, Maud passed at her Toronto home at the age of 67. Her remains were taken to Cavendish uh, to a plot that she had picked earlier um, on one of her trips. And the Lieutenant Governor of the province and the Premier were among the dignitaries that uh, came to her funeral. Uh, she had climbed her alpine path so deep, so to high, so steep. And we don't have time for all of this, but um, I will just go uh, a little bit through this. Do I have a minute or two? Yeah. So, you do, Kathy. Uh, she was uh, one of the most famous women magazine writers globally. Um, she had so much uh, done. And her very first great success was while she was in Prince Albert with her father. And she wrote a poem called On Cape La Force. And it was published in a newspaper back at home. Um, she started her journals when she was only 15. And... Uh, continued on throughout her life. She obtained the first copy of Anne translated in 1910 in Swedish. And um, these are um, some of the books that she wrote before she came to Ontario. Kilmeny, which I mentioned, and The Story Girl. Um, she finished the story girl. Here's the Alpine Path, the way it was originally published. Um, it was in uh, six different installments in every every woman's world magazine. And um, then this is the Chronicles book that uh, she did as for Paige. Um, she finished the Golden Road in 1913 in Leesdale. This is the copy of her, The Watchman and other poems that she uh, had uh, done with the Canadian publishers. And um, then she went on to write Anne's House of Dreams, which is here as well. 
Um, and then she went and she decided to write a story about Anne's sons and daughters during the war. So that was Rilla of Angleside. Um, some of her, uh, she was, well, she was, uh, Paige was given $40,000 for the first silent film that was made of Anne of Green Gables. Maud got nothing, of course. And the further chronicles, we talked about that one. Um, we've we've also mentioned these two, the Royal Society of Arts, and that great honor uh, bestowed on her. And um, she was named one of the twelve greatest Canadian women in the Toronto Star in 1923. A new stage of Canadian literature was coming into vogue, and she was uh, not happy with it, and they were very critical of her romantic style of writing. Um, so she took a lot of grief over that. Um, now that might be a good place for us to start to wrap it up in case we've got sure. some questions. Sure, um, that's that's great. Okay, so uh, yeah, we'll stop there. And... Do we have some questions in the uh, chat? Okay, has Hewen's mental health condition, formerly called religious melancholy, received a contemporary diagnosis? Um, yes. Um, I'm just trying to recall um, where you have the mood swings to go, your, you have your heights and your lows. Um, manic, manic depressive, maybe? Yes, that's right. Sorry. Yes, manic depression. Mm -hmm. And was he receiving any kind of treatment for it? I know you mentioned that yes. she was uh, taking some drugs towards the end. Yes, and she was using his drugs in some cases, unfortunately. Oh, I see. Okay. He, he was taking drugs that were used at the time, um, and uh, they didn't seem to help him a great deal. He went to a specialist in Boston, um, and um, it didn't seem to matter what they gave him. Um, she tried her own uh remedies as well um but nothing seemed to help very much and they didn't have such a great relationship as a result um mm -hmm. because when he was down he ignored the children and ignored her of course i see we have another question here has the normal manse become a museum yet um not yet Okay. No, um, I'm not sure what's going on there. I do know that Kathy Gassel is still working hard to um, create something there. And um, they're fundraising as far as I know. Um, but it's not officially opened as a museum. Okay. Did Bliss Carmen send Montgomery a letter? Yes, he did. And of course, Montgomery felt he was the best Canadian poet of, of her time. And um, so she was so honored. He did send her a letter. He did use um, Page at times, and he did publish a lot of work in the States as well as his Canadian books poetry books. And she also had copies of his books. Oh, okay. Yes. Were, were the uh, Emily stories written for the delineator included in the novels? Um, yes, they were taken from the novels. Um, and um, yeah, they were embellished by her and, and added into the novels. Okay, we have another question. It sounds like a large scope one. What role did religion and politics play in Montgomery's life? Um, religion played a big role in Montgomery's life. And in fact, she didn't, she didn't really think when she was younger that she wanted to ever 
marry a minister. And, um, you know, some of her lines were that, uh, you know, um, a minister's wife uh, just had a terrible life because she couldn't, um, you know, have a confidant or friend in her congregation. And so life would be difficult. And um, she didn't believe all of the religious beliefs that the church presented. Um, and she hated praying out loud, for instance. Um, she, she quietly, she seemed to have two personalities, one public personality in which she got along famously with everybody and did what she had to do to keep order and happiness and her private life, which was uh, journals. And in her journals, she uh, called it her grumble books and would tell about um, her disbeliefs in some parts of religion and so on. But um, religion paid a uh, played a large role in her life, both um, good and bad, I guess. Right. Now, politics. Um, I, I'm just, no, she, in fact, met some of the suffragettes and um, wasn't thrilled with their roles. Um, she didn't care if she uh, voted that much. Um, she was honored that she got to vote, but she didn't feel she, you know, could join a picket line or, or anything to protest that. But uh, now she she was strong about drinking. She didn't feel that people should drink. Uh, but uh, her grandfather wait a minute her her grandfather montgomery was a politician and he tended to be liberal and he was in the senate well, i shouldn't say he tended to be liberal um he was in the senate and so i would have to say she was a liberal at times, but in uh, Leesdale, sometimes there were no liberals running. So she she would vote definitely, but she would vote conservative. Uh, so, you know, she didn't necessarily, it didn't bother her that much. Okay, so we got a new question here. What was the public's reception of Among the Shadows? I can't comment on that because I haven't read it. Um, that Among the Shadows was a book that was brought out after her death. And um, all I have heard about it is that it is very dark. And I do know that um, towards the end, her stories were very dark as her um, temperament was dark and she was so unhappy with life in general. Right, and that makes, that makes sense. Next question, what was religious, what was religious melancholy? So the person who wrote this says, I'm a priest and have not heard the term. Yeah, um, it it was diagnosed as like when he went into his lows, he thought like in um, Presbyterianism, they believe in predestination. So you are either going to heaven or you are going to hell. And he felt in his lows that he was predetermined to go to hell and there was nothing he could do about it 
And so he should not ever have been preaching. He didn't feel he was worthy of being a minister when he was ill. And so all of those sad feelings that are wrapped up about his religious beliefs were called religious melancholia. And I suppose uh, it was a widely used term. So I suppose depending on uh, a person's religion and how religious they were, um, it would fit for them as well. But for him, it was the whole predestination and the fact that he felt he was not good enough to uh, go to heaven and therefore um, there was nothing to be done. Maud tried to get him to get help and he said, no, there's nothing can be done. This is my fate. And uh, mind you, he eventually did try to get help, um, but he always came back to the same ideas. New question. Can anyone access her journals at the University of Guelph? Um, I, yeah, they have been published. I don't know if you can see me or not. Yes, but they we can. have been published. They started out being published by Mary Rubio and Elizabeth Waterston, who were professors at Guelph. And they originally wrote the selected journals, thinking that some parts would be uh, boring for readers. And, and then they became so popular, and there I don't know how many journals there were, but uh, selected journals. So then they started to do complete journals. And they did the first couple of journals. They were long retired. And then the last, not the last of the journals, because I think there's still one more to do. Um, but then um, Jen Rubio, uh, Dr. Mary, o Mary Rubio's daughter, started bringing out the whole journals. And so I think there's probably six journals out now that you can purchase or borrow from the library. Um, they should have them and we have them at the site if anyone uh, lives near enough that they would wish to borrow them. So there's that wonderful resource. And um, it, you know, it shares all her writing. I had a couple of other books too that I wanted to mention. This sure. is by Elizabeth Waterston, and um, it's called Magic Island, and it gives uh, the story uh, of each of the books that she wrote, and it's called the fic uh, Magic Island, the Fictions of Lucy Maud Montgomery, and really, um, Elizabeth Waterston and Dr. Mary Rubio were the gurus of Montgomery studies, and also responsible for um, making Montgomery popular again. So they have been wonderful. And they were told that if they spent their time studying and writing on Montgomery, that they would probably not amount to much. <laughs> and, and they certainly did. And uh, now our, our network is so large with countries all over the world, people coming to the conference in PEI, um, you know, it's and, and groups like our own uh, in the States and so on. So there are many, many books. Uh, one last book I'd like to mention and one last person is Dr. Betsy Epperly, who has done Montgomery's um, scrapbooks, and they're amazing. And she's an academic um, and uh, also a, a present day guru when it comes to uh, Montgomery. And um, 
she's just a wonderful person and affiliated with the University of Prince Edward Island. So, you know, there's books out there on Montgomery. There's many more. I have a whole Montgomery room full of books I and memorabilia. <laughs> so, yeah, I could certainly, I can certainly attest, Kathy, that uh, when I did visit the uh, Leesdale property, uh, that uh, certainly you do have an impressive collection of uh, books, including the the journals and and other uh, yes. works that have been uh, prepared by other authors. So it really is a wealth of uh, of opportunity out there. So the person who had right. that question uh, yeah. can highly yeah. can highly recommend that. Okay. Well, I wonder if we should perhaps. Uh, uh, draw a, a close here to our uh, our evening. I know I think our questions could go on and on, but uh, uh, I certainly uh, want to make sure that we uh, we don't uh, wear out our welcome. Um, so I will say that uh, thank you so much, Kathy, for sharing your knowledge about Lucy Ma Montgomery. I know I learned a lot from your remarks and, and found the information quite fascinating. Uh, I do want to thank you and not only you, you, but the rest of the people in the Zoom room for joining us this evening. Uh, it certainly will be a lot of, of things for us to think about going forward. Um, also, for those of you in the room who perhaps uh, are feeling a, a little bit of a push here to register for our Kindred Spirits exhibition, please do so. We do encourage you to do that because again, uh, uh, all are welcome to uh, create something wonderful uh, in terms of recognition of, uh, of Lucy Ma Montgomery. So certainly on behalf of Cabbage, Kathy, I certainly thank you for accepting our uh, invitation to speak to us tonight. I know uh, uh, certainly we all have, uh, based on all of the comments I'm seeing in the chat room, there are lots of uh, uh, thank yous going your way. <laughs>